thank you very much. And I really would like to thank Shigato for inviting me to these amazing uh, series of papers and discussions. And I realize there is a typo in my title, so I apologize for that. It should be, when is traditional painting too modern? This painting by the modernist Nepali painter Tej Bhadu Chitrakar, called A Tribute to My Forefather, provides a meaningful reading into the negotiations of modernity within the traditional arts. Here, by virtue of the subject of the traditional artist, complete with the visual signifiers required, invokes the sense of continuity of an enduring religious and artistic past. And indeed, the tensions of tradition and modern continue to serve as familiar discursive binaries in the definitions of modern and contemporary art. But what about the frames of such local productions and consumption of traditional arts in the contemporary context? The issues of contemporary artistic production lie in the very definition of the tensions between tradition and modernity. Tradition suggests a temporality separate from and precedes modernity, thus implies a homogeneity of a pre-modern culture. It reinforces a continuous cultural continuity and a link with the past. These conceptions reproduce and perpetuate the binaries of the pre-modern slash modern and status slash change that is central to the Western conceptions of modernity. It maintains the ahistorical notion of the timeless culture and unchanging static tradition. What is traditional then? Is it only works whose styles conform to the past? Would traditional art then be mere copies? Do we continue to be guilty of reflecting the Orientalist paradigms in search of the, quote, authentic exotic? How do we distinguish these works of the established traditional artist from the mass-produced tourist consumer objects? By considering two artists here today, Ananda Muni Shakya from the early 20th century and a contemporary artist working in the traditional trend, Udaycharan Shreshta, I would like to problematize the ahistory of tradition in the representation and reinvention of tradition itself. From the mid-1920s to 1940s, an artistic and cultural renaissance of Newar tradition is attributed to the legendary artist Ananda Muni Shakya, who has, in the modern parlance, become synonymous to a new, quote, Newar style. Born in 1903, Anandamani introduced a radically new mode of Newar Pawa painting, marking a distinct aesthetic shift in artistic innovation. His legacy is a hybrid style of Newar, Tibetan, and Chinese aesthetics in a, quote, black and white technique. We know of, from his biography that he stayed in Lhasa for a year and typical of a hagiography of a gifted painter, it is said that he was given enough mineral pigments by His Holiness the 13th Dalai Lama to life, last him a lifetime. This ornate Newar style is characterized by the dramatic black background against a backdrop of Chinese dragons, landscape elements, and floral motifs indicating the influence of a Sino-Tibetan painting tradition. The exquisite brushwork, the exaggerated trivanga of the central figure, and the careful detailing of the ornate surfaces, particularly the halo, become hallmarks of the new style. Anandamuni's radical innovations are best illustrated in two examples, extant only in prints of the lost originals. Clearly inspired by Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus, Anandamuni's Padmapani reflects an admixture of European aesthetics and techniques, as well as a deep interest in realism. Distinctive is the black and white tonality to suggest photorealism, which along with the Chinese influence flooring drapery and realism of form, later become his signature style. While he does not compromise on iconographic connect correctness of Bodhisattva of Compassion, with the lotus attribute and the antelope skin draped over his shoulder, the fluidity of the composition, the exaggerated contrapposto, and articulated musculature are a sharp contrast to the traditional methods of painting, specifically the strict iconometric guidelines that would have dictated the precise execution of religious imagery and through symbolic colors. 
Recently, I was given access to Narutam Dash Reshta's extensive private collection, a local patron and collector now 95, who had opened the first modern art gallery in 1941 called Kathmandu Art Gallery, upon his return from a long stay in Calcutta. Here I began to piece together evidence of Anandamuni's genius and versatility as an artist and the historical context of his interest in photorealism. A key document in Shresha's collection was a signed contract by Anandamuni and two other artists hired as artists on commission to work for the Kathmandu Art Gallery at 30 rupees per month. This was the first formal gallery effectively catering to the elite and rising middle class in Kathmandu. However, was forced to close in 1944 after Anandamuni's death. Among the commissioned works by Anandamuni were four different paintings, each reflecting the distinctive departure from his religious paintings. Shresha recalls that the gallery included mostly European style paintings, as was popular among the middle class elite, and most were copies from European magazines. Both paintings, as you see here, rendered in the manner of, black, of the black and white photographs, emphasize the realism of this scene, including three-dimensional shading, light and shade, and chiaroscuro, which were not part of the visual vocabulary of traditional new art painting. Two other paintings include photorealistic portraits, including that of Paul von Lindenberg, the second president of Germany from 1925 to uh, 34. This curious inclusion of European portraiture will not come as a surprise given Anandamuni's association with the Rana, Rana ruling families at patrons, and specifically with General Kesher Samse Rana, who was, the, uh, who was a true Anglophile in the, in the sense of the word, having been to London in 1908, where he took along two artists. So enamored was General Kesher that when he returned from England, he changed his name from Kesher, the uh, traditional uh, Hindu name, to Kaiser, in, de in deference of Emperor Kaiser Franz Josef of Prussia, whom he so admired. Paralleling the British Raj from 1845 to 1951, Nepal's neo colonizers were the local Rana elite whose anglophile tastes mirrored the aesthetics of the British Raj as seen in these photographs from the early 20th, early 20th century. The Ranas were fascinated with the British and emulated their lifestyles and their neoclassical tastes, but at the same time, they zealously guarded their Hindu sociocultural mores so that they could prove themselves equal and not subordinate to the foreign powers. The deep mistrust of colonial encroachment resulted in the policy of strict isolationism until 1951, when all foreigners were barred from entering the country except through special permission. For the Ranas, photography provided a critical medium of propaganda for their hegemony, beginning with the founder of the Rana dynasty, Jamabadur, as you see here. Born into a middle-class Chetriya clan at the Kors, Jamabadur quickly rose to power after the Koth massacre, a bloody court intrigue of 1846. He then made the Shah kings a nominal head and established the line of hereditary prime ministers. Jamabadur carefully crafted this new pedigree and power from a middle class Chatriya warrior by equating himself to the Indian Maharajas, complete with a name change to the honorific title of Rana. To complete the princely legitimacy, he became ruler of two states of Kaski and Lamjung in western Nepal, officially elevating his status and giving him and his successors the title of Maharaja as the hereditary prime ministers. Now belonging to the small elite Thakuri clan, uh, the Ranas traced their family lineage to the royal house of the Mewar kingdom in Rajasthan. Jangavadu further strengthened this newly constructed pedigree by arranging a marriage alliance between the Ranas and the Indian principalities, as seen here in the photograph, sent to their Indian in-laws. 
As markers of modernity, Jangabadur becomes among the first Maharajas to travel to Europe in 1850, disregarding the long-held belief of ritual pollution of crossing the Kalapani of the Mlecha lands. Upon his return, full-scale efforts were made, uh, were put in place to create the new Rana aesthetic and began the legacy for his descendants to live in the high style of an anglicized native. Formal life-size portraits, as you see here, and grand-scale palaces in the neoclassical style become signifiers of the new Rana political power. Photography, as well, become the medium du jour to demonstrate Rana authority and ostentatious lifestyle. Following their mandates, uh, following their patrons' mandates, the Newar artist suitably <coughs> develop skills in Western realism, as we see in the backdrop, and European aesthetics, as we see from various photographs. From the, Orient from the European pastoral vista to what we see here, an exotic Orientalist landscape painted by the Neymar artists. It is within this political milieu and framing of modernity that we can read Ananda Muni's response and innovations in religious painting. Most dramatic is his wrathful Mahakala, which he painted a year before his death in the, at the age of 42, with the emphasis on photographic realism rendered in the face and the articula articulation of musculature, as seen in this old print reproduction of the now missing original. These paintings of Buddhist themes were mass produced as posters and were acquired by the local Newar Buddhists. Following the legacy of Newar artists, in their innate fluency to emulate different styles as required by their patrons, we see here Ananda Muni's signed painting of Bhimsen Thapa in an anachronously early 18th style, or the Ravi Varma-esque painting called Dream Swapnila. Distinct from the, Rana, distinct from the elite Rana taste are Ananda Muni's religious paintings of a distinctly Newar style, which generated a subculture of local consumption among the affluent Newar community, specifically of businessmen, merchants, and traders. For the vernacular, Anandamuni's posters became markers of a Newar ethnic identity, separate from the ruling Kshatriya elite. Anandamuni's legacy continues today as the hallmark of traditional Pawa painting tradition, and this is again um, a recent artist, a young artist, following the same black and white technique. This revival of traditional painting must be contextualized with the rise of a new consumer patronage, especially after the opening of Nepal in the, nine, nine, uh, in the late 1950s. With Tibet still close to the outside world until 1980, Nepal became the utopia for tourists, hippies, backpackers, and the rest in search of the mythical Shangri-La, continuing the Orientalist construction of the Himalayas as the pristine utopia of the exotic other. It is this popular demand for the spiritual authenticity of the imagined authentic exotic that has given rise to the mass commodification in the genre of tourist art as seen here. Yet for the local consumption, Newar artists continue to contest the past, here I will read Uday Charan Shreshta's work as a paradox of modernity and tradition. His works have notably influenced the aesthetics and local consumptions of, of traditional painting since 1990 as they, were, as they are at once celebrated or contested as too modern and therefore deemed non-traditional. Uday Charan, born in 1964, began painting at a young age, shown here at 16, when he won the National Prize for Traditional Painting at the National Association of Fine Arts Competition. By the mid-1990s, Uday had developed his distinctive style, uh, creating a unique convention of contemporary Newar Pawa painting. Radical departures from tradition are his use of the oil medium an extraordinary realism of figures and unconventional composition accentuated by bold, dramatic colors. Here, in his most celebrated work of 1993, Annapurna, the goddess of bounty, is depicted as a luminous, youthful, and sensual figure. 
Western techniques are evident in the emphasis of hyperreality, the bodily proportions, and in the unconventional palette. The striking intensity of the gaze, almost portrait-like realism of the face, marked the artist's signature style. The meticulous detail of the surface patterning, the three-dimensionality of the figure, and rich colors reflect his mastery of, of the technique. However, he localizes his subject. Uh, however, he localizes his subjects with visual references to the distinctive Newar religious practice and iconographic accuracy. Annapurna is an important goddess in the Newar tantric tradition, where she is worshipped in her an iconic form as a vase of plenty. In his composition, Uday references these localized aspects with the temple and vase behind the goddess. This development of a distinctively um, contemporary Newar style, devoid of any Tibetan stylistic elements, also meant the rise of a new patronage, where the principal clientele are specifically the Newar community. Almost all of his paintings after the 1990s began to be copied by other artists and sold as poster prints, tourist paintings, and even on the web, including Amazon.com. His realism, celebrated by the Newar community as a distinctive Newar style, has also come, come under harsh criticism. In reference to, his one, to one of his well-known paintings of Vajrayogini, uh, a foreign scholar comments, quote, the depiction of this deity would be considered unthinkably in poor taste in pre-modern Nepal. Such mutations are triggered by the need of the tourist industry in which output increases while profit margins and the overall knowledge decrease. Hence the requirement for cheap, uninformed differentiation to generate new product lines and revenues." Unquote. For those critics, Uday is quick to point out, quote, my training is traditional painting. I never claim myself as a pure tanka painter, and I do not want to be one either. I study and try my level best to paint according to iconography. Uday Charan has indicated to me that he carefully relies on original sadhanas or visualizations to capture the essence, essence of the deity. The realism of the figures, dynamic composition is his vision of the divine presence of Vajrayogini. And here again, the sky-going sky yogini, Yogini's Newar significance is emphasized as one of the four tantric projectors of the valley through the reference of a temple in the lower right composition. This work, through the sadhana of the tantric goddess inscribed at the bottom of the painting, embodies the essence of Bhagalamukhi's divine nature as the overcomer of, uh, of enemies. I bring here a 19th century painting of Bagalamukhi, now at the Los Angeles County Museum, as a counterpoint to illustrate both continuities and departures of Newar's style. His use of the oil medium further reinforces, is further reinforced by his conscious efforts to portray unique cultural signifiers, especially in the jewelry and attributes of the figures, to indicate historical accuracy. The extraordinary precision in detail, seen here in the crown, as well as the girdle. And I should say there are a number of now um, contemporary jewelry designs that are based on his uh, uh, jewelry designs in the paintings, um, are found in his uh, detailed design. Interestingly, even in the detail of the figure, Uday is quick to point out that the realism and sensuality of the forms are still rooted within the traditional sources. A 19th century painting of the goddess Tripura Sundari uh, depicts the goddess in the traditional format with the formal hieratic qualities and flatness that, deri that is derived from the watercolor-based traditional Pawa style. A comparison with the bodice of the two paintings indicates Uday's inspiration and his transformation of flatness form into a realistic articulation in the oil medium. Uday's detailed works are a slow process, and he says it takes him anywhere from two to three years to complete it. From transforming the flatness into luminous canvases is often, therefore, a laborious process. 
This work of, uh, of the Borfes Varahi, he has been working on for at least three years. To him, the canvases must capture the divine presence of the deity. Yet, like masters of the Newar art, excuse me. Yet, like the master Newar artists of the past, he is proficient in several styles, fluidly shifting between one style to the other as mandated by the demands of the patrons. As conclusion to this discussion, I'd like to bring here a work of the 32-year-old Samudraman Singh Shrestha, who follows Uday's experimentation of the oil medium. His most recent work perhaps is most apt for this discussion as the work challenges and juxtaposes the binaries of modernity and tradition of old and new. As a backdrop of the painting recalls the 15th century Newar style Amogosidi painting now in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Similarly juxtaposed in the traditional style is the presence of Mahakala rendered in the contemporary mode. Dismantling the binaries of modern versus tradition, these contemporary expressions of traditional art, I propose, must be seen as signifiers of modernity. In this new context, it is about the creation of meaning, and hence objects become tangible symbols of cultural embeddedness. Through negotiations of the past and present, a new hybrid visual semiotics is constructed. As Stephen Blastros, in his study of Japanese visual culture, states, Quote, tradition is as modern a trope, a prescript is a prescriptive representation of socially desi desirable or sometimes undesirable institutions and ideas thought to have been handed down from generation to generation, unquote. The discourses of traditional art produces a cultural self-consciousness as new meanings and constructs become reified in the consumption of these visual expressions. I would argue here that it is the local, but excuse me, I would argue here that it is the particular local production and consumption, separate from the external Western consumer, that gives rise to a distinctive type of self-identity and self-representation self in the revival of traditional Newar aesthetics. It is these cultural objects of Newar style that are displayed and collected in the modern homes of the urban elite in Nepal and the diaspora population that serve a visual trope of a larger Nepalese national identity. Despite of the fact that the Newars themselves marginalized constitutes only 5.5% of Nepal's population of 28 million. Thank you. <laughs>